hey, we have an update on the next generation naval attack submarine coming to us in the 2030s. Uh, we've, we've read this report a couple times, but they've updated the report here. So uh, it says here the Navy wants to procure. This is a report to Congress, by the way. Um, report to Congress about the next generation submarine. Uh, you, you can download and read this on your own if you want to. It's even got pictures if you do that. But I'm just going to go over the highlights. I'm not going to read it word for word because we read these updates a lot. But we're going to begin procuring nuclear powered submarines as of 2031. That's the new date. So we're funding research and development of the next generation attack submarine. Now we're spending about $100 million a year just in research and design. Still a lot of money, but we should start procuring them, obtaining them in 2031. That's, that's the goal. That's the earliest date I've seen too. So I think they might be pushing that up a little bit. Uh, the Virginia class program continues to be built. We're building two boats a year. We have 34 now as of 2021. Uh, as of fiscal year 2019, that we've been putting the Virginia payload modules, which is an additional 84 foot long mid-body section, making the submarine much longer and heavier, by the way, which I expect would make it slower but it gives them four large diameter vertical launch tubes, each holding seven Tomahawk missiles or other payloads. And this other payloads is really interesting. We have special payloads that can fit in the same tubes as a Tomahawk and launch those. So it's no longer just Tomahawk land and sea attack missiles. It can be equipment for SEALs. It can be other weapons that aren't public yet that once they do become public, we'll talk about. But uh, other payloads is very, very cool. This is a very... Um, I'm sure it will come out eventually. Okay, submarine construction industrial base. They're not adding any new bases, but they're going to be building these at EB Electric Boat there in Groton, uh, Quonset Point, Rhode Island. What, what some of you may not know is they build half of the new attack submarines in Rhode Island. They put them on a barge, and then they tug them over to the, the Thames River in Connecticut, where the other shipyard is, and they assemble them there in the assembly building at EB. And then also, if you go down the coast to Virginia, they, they have the Newport News shipbuilding. And these are the only two shipyards in the country capable of building nuclear powered web or ships. Rather, uh, we really probably should have a West Coast shipyard that is certified to build nuclear weapons. Uh, the reason why we don't have that is for environmental protection reasons, which I'm on board with and I understand. Uh, but for military reasons, we should have the ability to build nuclear ships on both coasts. That's that's really important. Okay, and that's about it. So what do you guys think of the new, uh, we don't know a lot of details, but do you guys have any questions about the new SSNX coming to a Navy near you in 2031? That's really the update is that new year. It's a little bit sooner than we expected. Would it be a good short-term solution to rush production of the SSKs instead of disrupting SEMA? Um, I think we're relying on our allies to build the SSKs. So... Just about every other NATO country builds those at this point. So we probably don't have to bother with that. At some point, we're supposed to be building three Virginias a year, but that's not mentioned in this report. I believe that's already started. How old is the Virginia? Uh, the design, I think the first commissioning was 2004. And so, um, but we build two, two every year. So like there was two this year that, that, that have been produced. Anyway, really good stuff. All right, so I got a surprise for you. You guys are going to like this. Look at this monster. <laughs> this is not Photoshop. This is a real plane from the 80s. Yes. And uh, before I even get into it, I want you guys, if you want to know more about this plane, there's a very good book written by one of the chief designers of the Tacit Bloom. This is a secret skunk works project that has been unclassified now for, for some time, to be honest, but we're going to talk about it today. But the book I want you to read is called skunk works. It's a fantastic read. I've read it a couple different times um, about the skunk works Lockheed Martin Northrop group uh, secret facility where they designed these low observable, which means stealth, right? Uh, airplanes. And this might be the ugliest airplane I've ever seen, but it is a great, great design. Let's read a little bit from the piece from The War Zone, written by Mr. Tyler Rogaway, really good guy. Um, let's see what he says. He says, uh, the fantastic 10% true YouTube channel, make sure you check out the YouTube channel, uh, the creation of Steve Davies uh, recently had Denny Yarvi as a guest. Yarvi, it's either Jarvi or Yarvi. 
uh, was an accomplished U.S. Air Force fighter pilot that found himself descending into the shadowy Black Project's world in the early 1980s to help run a top secret battlefield surveillance aircraft experimental or BASAX demonstrator group. So this is basically a demonstration of technology that if this works, we can mass produce airplanes based on the technology that this thing proves doesn't necessarily mean it looks like this but it could but i want you to notice the resemblance of this cockpit and the b2 cockpit very similar to each other yeah on the outside not on the inside uh let's move down northrop's whale which was the name of that monstrosity was a demonstrator was the centerpiece of the tacit blue program is maybe the most famous for its absolutely homely looks Wow, ha ha, this is not the prettiest machine I've ever seen, said Yarvi's first impression of the aircraft after setting eyes on it. Yet it was in a product of the early days of stealth revolution, which broke all traditions when it came to combat aircraft. So what this tested was unlike the stealth fighter, which had a different approach to stealth, a very diamond shape, flat surfaces angled away from the receiver. Uh, this had a rounded shape and getting a rounded stealth design was very computationally intensive uh, algorithm to, 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 to process. And so we didn't really have the technology or the computers to do large scale rounded stealth surfaces at the time, but they managed to at least make the cockpit be a little bit very stealthy. And the jet intake, which is behind the pilot's head here, uh, sucking air down. I'll show you a drawing of it, a better drawing here. This is the YouTube uh, video you guys should watch. I'm not gonna play it here so we don't get in trouble, but I support this YouTube channel. Uh, Tacit Blue BASAX uh, interview with Danny Yarvey. Definitely watch that. Oh, and here's a picture of it. I swear this looks Photoshopped, but it's an actual photo of this thing in flight. And it's extremely unstable, he says in that interview. I've already watched parts of it where they needed a computer to keep the thing steady in flight because without the computer making micro adjustments, this thing would spin all over the place. It was unstable in both pitch and roll, which means it would just tumble if it had it not had that flight assistance. Yeah, it flies. I know, right? It wasn't just a model. It's in the flipping air. There's more pictures coming up. But let's read the highlights of that interview that I do want you to watch. Um, it says, well, just one tacit blue whale ever flew. There was another non-completed airframe in reserve just in case the first prototype was lost. Yarvi thinks the second airframe would likely was likely destroyed after the program was shuttered, which is a shame. They need to put this in a museum. Uh, I hope they put the other one in the museum. We'll find out. The first airframe was tucked from Northrop's Hawthorne plant in Area 51 in a partially assembled form. Uh, Tacit Blue was tested against the F-15 with its powerful APG-63 radar and the test pilot at the controls. The Eagle never saw the whale on radar until it was within visual range and then they could get the radar beam on them. That's great. So this thing worked good for being a stealth uh, demonstrator uh, flight. No other airplane detected tacit blue via its own RF transmissions during testing phase, despite having powerful radar and data link systems on board. The low probability of intercept or LPI tactics employed by those systems work to keep the aircraft concealed while flying very near those threat systems, emitting RF energy. Yeah, so he's talking about Doppler versus, uh, there's two types of, two basic types of radar. There's probably more than that, but one is Doppler and then there's the other uh, rotate one. Um, and depending on which one you go after, like Doppler, you just want to maintain range. And then the other one, you want to be narrow on it. <clears throat> anyway, I'm sure somebody in the chat that knows more about radar than, than I do can talk about tactics. Uh, Tacit Blue's national concept of operation involved flying over or very near the forward edge of the battlefield around 25 to 30,000 feet, orbiting overhead at 250 knots uh, or so while radar scanning the area below. And that so it was like a recon mission but instead of like the sr-71 flying high overhead or the u-2 taking a snapshot this thing could loiter over the battlefield stealthfully giving live updates to enemy troop positions and other things that it detected uh back to the command center so this thing was going to be stationed in europe in the event of a war with the warsaw pact the soviets uh, coming through the fall to gap. So really good stuff. Hey, thank you for the gifted subs there, Dr. Estuary. I'll get to chat in just a second. I see you guys have a lot of questions. Hold on to your questions for just a minute. Here's another great view from the top 
of um, the tests that blew in flight. And look how the the air duct, the jet, sucks air from right behind the pilot here and pushes it out the back. And then it's got this little flap that I'm sure is used for stability, but it also helps hide that heat signature from the ground. So anybody looking up at it wouldn't see the exhaust as, as well through infrared detection. Yeah, very, very cool. Like if you're looking down on it, I imagine you would see it, but looking up from the bottom, not as much. I, it, I can't believe it actually flew. I knew about this program. I didn't know that it worked. <laughs> I, I knew that it had been canceled. I assumed that it never flew. I'm shocked to see these, these photos. This is incredible to me. Yeah, I did not know that this actually flew. There it is. Here's another one. Look at this. This almost looks like a model. Because look at the ground. Yeah, I don't know how real this one is. There's like no exhaust here. This one might be a model. Yeah, I don't know if I believe that one. I'm real skeptical, you know, but look at this here. You can see the exhaust right there. Wow. Crazy, crazy plane. Oh, here we go. Oh, I wish we could zoom in on this. I can't quite read these, but here you can see the line drawings of them. Really cool design. This, this, this type of uh, inlet is used on our cruise missiles. Yep. The, uh, the Tomahawk has something similar to that. I think it's on the bottom, but either way, it has an inlet like that, like that. All right, let's see what Chad has to say. Again, thank you, MightyB83, for the resub. Johnny Brack, thank you for subbing with the Prime. And Dr. Estuary, thank you for the 10 gifted subs. Really do appreciate it, my friend. Do you guys have anything for me here? Uh, see, G Fengineer says, I thought the front view was ugly until he showed me the top view. <laughs> yeah, and then you were like, hey, that front's not so bad. Here it is here. And uh-oh, whoops. I'm trying to zoom in on this. That takes me to this. Oh, do we have more photos here? Wow, this is another article. Oh, this is this is an article about how they got this thing developed. Oh, I'll read that later. Maybe we'll talk about this one in the future time. But look at this. This almost looks photoshopped. Uh, it just it just looks so out of place. Uh, the flat gray paint. It just it looks like it has no depth. But apparently this is real. It, everything else looks real except this part. Oh, they might be photoshopping over some components. This could be a doctored photo to hide certain things that they were testing perhaps. Yeah, it could, that, that could be what's going on there. Cause something about this just doesn't, doesn't pass the uh, un, un, uncanny valley of something is real versus something is fake. This is kind of in that. I don't know. It's creeping me out. Yeah. And look at, there's even a video about this. What? Okay. I can't watch it, but I want you guys to go watch this video. Go to the war zone, go to this article and click on these links. Cause uh, that's really cool. Okay. I see there's a lot of questions now. Tyropo says that intake and butt end are very similar to what the Navy's new aerial refueling drone has. They probably use the technology in that. I wouldn't be surprised. There are photos of one of them being buried at the end of the runway after testing was complete. Oh, no. So are they both gone? Ben Rich. I think he's the guy who wrote the book Skunk Works. Yeah, Ben, I recognize that name. He was the chief of Skunk Works. Um, we have the tech to take ET home, but it would take an act of God to get it out. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fake news, Slippery. That's hilarious, dude. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I don't know. I, well, I, I read the book Skunk Works, so I'm aware of this program. I just don't remember if in the book they ever talk about it actually flying. So this that's new information for me, or I'm just not remembering it. But yeah, this is this is a crazy program called Tacit Blue. We were so far ahead. Uh, I believe it was um, Tom Clancy called this the Frisbee, but he got the description way wrong in his uh, uh, Red Storm Rising books. Yeah, but somehow Tom Clancy knew about this program when he shouldn't have. <laughs> that guy, that guy's a national treasure. We lost him too soon. Uh, Tom Clancy, why aren't you still with us? Um, all right, hey, let's talk. This is our final story of the day. Uh, the F-15 gets a new upgrade. This is a really cool system. This is why I added this to the to the news today is uh, the F-15 uses a new infrared pod to shoot down an F-16 with an AIM-120 missile, which is not normally infrared homing. So they figured out a way to use the extended range of the AIM-120 air-to-air missile and shoot down 
other planes without using the radar to lock onto the target like you would normally, alerting the target that it's about to get shot, right? Now they can lock on beyond visual range, that's key here, BVR with this infrared pod, and then take that data, send it to the missile, and shoot down the plane uh, without it having any kind of alert from being locked on with a radar in that sense, which is the primary way your target would know he's got an AIM-120 coming. Yeah, it's not the only way. You can do a mad dog attack on it, but without going into tactics, uh, this is a big development. This is a big deal. So from the piece, Tyler again writes, Tyler's getting two articles in today's news. Don't tell me I never did anything for you, Tyler. I, I joke about that because he's done so much for me. This is the least I could do for him. Anyway, the U.S. Air Force pushes to get the infrared search and tracker IRST systems to its F-16 Charlie and Delta Eagles. Those are the ones that aren't the bombers. Those are the air to air fighters. Uh, the F-15E is the bombing two seater. OK, the other jets in the future hit a huge milestone on August 5th, 2021, when the Eagle from Eglin Air Force Base 80 or 85th Test and Evaluation Squadron uh, shot down a QF-16 full-scale aerial target, that's this thing here, with a name 120 using the IRST for targeting. The Legion Pod, what a name for the pod, by the way. The Legion Pod is the F-15C has already proven itself in test and employed in short-range AIM-9X Sidewinder. So it works with the Sidewinder as well, but not the AIM-120 AMRAM, which is the Eagle's BVR weapon. Major Brian Davis of the 85th TES Chief Air to Air Weapons and Tactics. What a great job to have. This guy's having butt fun. Uh, stated the following in an Air Force release. This successful live missile test is significant because the F-15 equipped with the IRST queued AIM-120 allows us to achieve detection, tracking, and targeting weapons employment and verification of an intercept without being dependent upon radar energy. It is also not susceptible to radio jamming because it's not using radio for guidance. That's a win-win. And the target doesn't know it's being shot. That's amazing. The Well, I, they may be able to de detect the IR, so I have to be careful about that. Modern weapons, modern aircraft have that kind of capability. But it's not radar, okay? It's not radar. Uh, the ability to detect, track, sort, and even identify aerial targets without using radar BVR ranges is a massive upgrade to the Mighty Eagle and comes at a time when stealth aircraft and cruise missiles are beginning to proliferate the globe. The Air Force is already rushing to modify its high-end training to confront this reality. But the IRST, with its detection capabilities, uh, uninfluenced by low observable or stealthy radar evading designs, can't come soon enough. This is a great way to keep uh, the F-15s in the fight. Uh, passive natural, passive nature of the sensor, unlike radar, gives off no electromagnetic radiation also provides for a whole new set of tactics that can be really challenging an enemy's ability to detect, locate the fighter. Yeah, because even if they see the weapon coming at them, they don't necessarily know where, where that fighter is. Now look at the field of view on this thing. Obviously it's forward facing and it looks like it might have 90 degree left, 90 degree right. So that's a limitation. They need to make this thing, oh, I wonder, do they have a shot of the rear end of the pod? Yeah, right there. So it's just the front. I was thinking maybe they had a sensor looking forward and a sensor looking aft, but you wouldn't need a sensor looking aft because you're not going to shoot the missile behind you. But it would be cool to have a sensor looking behind you to see if anybody's coming up behind you. That would be cool. Look at me. I'm making up my own shit now. Uh, give me two. One facing forward, one facing aft. Uh, oh, here we go. Legion pod. Can I zoom in on that? Yay. Okay, so this is if you were going to buy one. This is the sales pitch from Lockheed Martin. It says using the IRST 21 sensor advanced processing capability, Legion pod detects and tracks uh, targets in radar denied environments. Uh, 130 pods rapidly delivered to support the U S air forces F 15 fleet by 2020. So we've already got 130 of these pods, 50 new jobs. Oh yeah. Lo the uh, Lockheed Martin Lockheed. Yeah, it is Lockheed Martin uh, has a uh, factory there in Orlando. I was very familiar with that. That place is walled off behind so much razor wire. Uh, you would think it's a prison, but it's actually, uh, it's a factory where they do a lot of cool things. I should have applied for a job there. That would have been fun. Come on, I would have come here and told you guys all about it. So they got software, hardware, sustainment. So they do the maintenance for them. I wonder how much each one of these costs. 
Anyway, very capable pod. Glad to see it is being employed here. Um, let's see what chat is saying now. Cabo says the Russians have had this for years. Yes, this is not new technology. This is only new to us. We should have had this a long time ago. We, we, we've gone adrift in our march forward and maintaining a technological lead. And we burned up a lot of our goodwill or kind of the lead that, that, that we had uh, going after projects that were high minded and not practical. But it looks like now we're finally back on track to building systems that work and we're getting them just in time for what could be potentially a large conflict with China coming on the horizon that none of us want, but we have to be ready for. Uh, did I see you cover the new version of the Vista F-16? I don't think I've done that yet, no. Uh, Blood for the Blood God, I love the name, says when you're talking about computer-aided flight controls, the F-117 had the same issue with being unstable. I wouldn't be surprised with the weird shape, the diamond shape of that design. They probably had similar con control problems and the flight computer, good point. Uh, Clipper says, bear in mind, the F-35 A, Bs, and Cs uh, all more than likely have this capability. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, that's fair. Yeah. I didn't know that. I don't know a lot about airplanes. It's This is kind of on the edge of my, this is not even my expertise. This is on the edge of my knowledge at this point. I just read what people write when it comes to things that I don't know about. Do you think uh, the conflict in China would be limited? I hope so. God, I hope it doesn't go full scale. If it goes total war, we might lose. Yeah, we may not win a total war with China. And then we're in trouble because then we got Chinese soldiers on every corner occupying the United States. And that's that's a Red Dawn movie part three, right? Uh, Panzer says permission to break out the Liberty chest. Yeah, man, let's do that now. We're going to wrap up the new segment here. Great interaction with chat. I love this segment. You guys are the best, but we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to do some more cold waters. I'll see you guys in a few minutes, okay? <laughs> 